climate migrations could displace up to 4 billion people. That's half the world population today and more people than existed when I was born. Do you live somewhere that people will flee or will migrants flood into your area? And what can you do about it? Not to worry, as perhaps the only permaculture urbanist, I've got you covered. In this episode, I'll share strategies the nations and cities can use to prepare for these changes and more. Welcome to Edenicity, best practices for sustainably abundant cities. Now I have to admit, I had to really wrestle with the title of this video because the easy clickbaity way to get a zillion views would have been to label it something like the best and worst cities for global climate migrations. But the problem with that is that population and climate models are very complex. Carbon emissions and population growth patterns could change sharply. Land use may change, both randomly and in response to climate change and also to avert its worst effects. And as I'll discuss briefly at the end today, ocean currents could change unexpectedly. All of these could shift the intensity and even the direction of climate migrations. Either way though, cities need to become much more resilient to change. Let's get into that study. This is a paper on the future of the human climate niche that appeared in the journal PNAS in 2020. This paper has three basic points. First, the human temperature niche is surprisingly narrow. People tend to live in areas with a mean annual temperature between 11 and 15 degrees Celsius or 52 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit, which is of course a lot less than the annual or even the daily variation in temperatures in most areas. Second, the geographical position of this temperature niche is going to shift more in the next 50 years, according to the best climate models, than it has over the last 6,000 years. And third, without migration, up to a third of humanity is likely to experience temperatures worse than are currently experienced in the hottest parts of the Sahara Desert. So let's break this down. Do people really follow temperature? Well, the authors say the circumstantial evidence is very strong. They argue that 50% of the world works on small farms and their labor is limited by temperature. And a separate study of 166 countries that looked at temperature variations within each country throughout the year and from year to year found that economic productivity peaked at 13 degrees Celsius, right in the middle of that supposed ideal range. This was true, to quote the paper, globally across agricultural and non-agricultural activity in rich and poor countries. Wow, this gave me pause. I don't know about you, but I like to think of myself as pretty adaptable, pretty capable of living in a number of places, and also with the benefit of things like air conditioning. Many Southeast Asian countries have broken through the industrial and financial productivity barrier. I'm thinking of Hong Kong and Singapore here. But even with all the modern conveniences, we still observe this effect. And here's how pronounced it is. The chart on the left shows in all those blues and greens and purple the past distribution of people by temperature. And you can see that there's a sharp peak at around just under 15 degrees Celsius and a smaller peak at about 25 degrees Celsius. That's basically India. And when they plugged in the climate models, in particular the models predicting a 3.2 degrees Celsius change in mean annual temperatures, worldwide by 2070, they got the curve shown in red again on the left. But to me, the really striking thing is if you look in that plot on the right of temperature versus basically time, what you find is that 6,000 years before present, there's two different studies that have the human population at low to basically current temperatures, then 500 years before present, 300 years before present, and the current moment, all basically at the same temperature. To me, this is really surprising that we live in such a narrow niche, even to this day, it's just like, are we really so constrained by our environment? But now comes the shock, part two of the study, where they took climate models and applied them to where people live today and said, okay, what's this gonna do to temperature? And here's the answer. You see that it's a huge difference. It's a much bigger difference than we've dealt with through all of recorded history. And it really gives me pause given how narrow our niche is right now. Okay, so it's going to get a lot hotter where we live today. The study illustrates that with this terrifying chart. The hottest parts of the world are shown in black, mainly in the Sahara Desert. That's today. In 50 years, the shaded parts in Africa and in Brazil, India, Southeast Asia, Northern Australia are all going to be as high as the Sahara Desert. Think about that. Now again, is this inevitable? No. 
But this is according to the worst case climate models. And so far, looking at how slow we've been to act on climate change, I would not rule those out at all. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were living in any of those places that is shaded in this diagram, I might be thinking at some point about moving somewhere cooler. And again, this is not just a matter of personal comfort or preference. This is a matter for large populations, billions of people, potentially of life or death. How many people will be forced to migrate to survive? Well, again, it depends a lot on the models. This plot shows how many migrants we can expect using the different climate and population models. So the RCP 2.6 all the way up to 8.5 are the three climate models uh, considered by the study from least to most scary. The RCP 8.5 would be a 3.2 degrees Celsius increase in the global mean annual temperature, and the RCP 2.6 would be 1.5 Celsius. The different plots in these charts are for the different population models. And the bad news is, since this was a 2020 paper, we've already surpassed the lowest of the population models. So the one on the left of all three charts, we've already gone past. That was 8 billion people. We passed that already. The highest one, the one in the middle on all three charts, is a global population of about 11.5 billion, again by 2070. So the best case scenario on these charts is at least 1 billion climate migrants. And the worst case scenario is just over 4 billion climate migrants. Now compare that to the number of migrants that we have today. Today's world population includes 0.28 billion climate migrants. So we're looking at a factor of three to maybe as much as 15 increase in migrations by 2070, just due to climate. Already, countries throughout the world are showing a lot of stress due to migrations. We're seeing this in Syria. We're seeing this starting to play out through much of Europe. And it's going to get much, much more intense in coming decades under all of these scenarios. So it's perfectly fair to ask, where will people be coming from and where will they go? The study authors put together this map showing the suitability change of mean annual temperature throughout the world. The green areas become more suitable for human habitation and the dark orange areas become less suitable in their models. Now I've separated these into basically departure areas and arrival areas. The departure zones would be the southern United States, Mexico, Brazil, the Caribbean, Southern Europe, uh, the current Sahel, Saudi Arabia, pretty much all the Gulf states, India, Southeast Asia, and Northern Australia. The arrival regions under this model again are the Canadian border, the entire Northwest coast of the US, all the way up to Southern Alaska and the Aleutian Islands, the UK, Iceland, Turkey, a bit of a surprise, Georgia, Western Russia. Russia was a really big winner in terms of the climate future. Almost all of Western Russia and the entire Kazakh steppe, the Russia-Kazakhstan border, all the way out through Mongolia, Northern China, the entire Korean peninsula, Peninsula, except for a little dot at the southern end of South Korea, and Japan, everywhere north of Tokyo, would become potentially arrival regions where populations could flourish in the worst case climate model 50 years from now. If you're in one of the departure areas, don't fret. And if you're in one of the arrival areas, don't get too comfortable because this study does not model extreme weather events such as storms, floods, droughts, and wildfires, even in arrival zones. It doesn't model rainfall changes and water management. And I will definitely do an episode in the not too distant future about water management because right now the discussion of water is almost entirely based on a false premise that it is a scarce resource and not that it is part of a living system wherein trees act as a major pump in the water cycle. And again, I'll get into that in a later episode. We're also not looking at deforestation, reforestation, and afforestation, which is basically planting forests in areas that have not had forests for really long periods of time. In the permaculture community, which is basically applied ecology, I've noticed that people tend to dismiss the idea of going too far in terms of reforestation and afforestation. But I think it is a possibility in cities and countries need to be resilient enough to handle the possibility of an overshoot. Not that we should curb any efforts to plant trees, it's just that we need to be ready for changes we can't fully anticipate or control, even if they're a result of our best efforts. And finally, there's the possible collapse of the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, otherwise known as the Atlantic Conveyor Belt. This is the current that comes out of the Gulf of Mexico and delivers warm water into the North Atlantic warming the Nordic states in the United Kingdom. There are some very controversial, but very well thought out climate models and observations that suggest that it could shut down abruptly sometime this century, which could lead to much colder weather 
in the Nordic countries and the UK, which would of course change the map that I just showed you a moment ago. So given how unpredictable all of this is, what are cities and countries to do about it? Let's start with the departure areas. Cities should do everything they can to stop depopulation. And the best way to do this is with an Edenicity plan to cool the metro in the summer by 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, which would take it well below even the worst change anticipated by the models. Now there's a very long list of techniques that will depend to some extent on location, but the highlights that apply to just about every location include capturing floodwaters and recharging groundwaters with forested drainage basins, building narrow east to west streets with layered food forests for shade, using carbon negative construction and solar and wind power with hydro storage. Nations should provide high speed intercity rail in order to reduce the number of cars and the total amount of space devoted to highways, which is not only a matter of fossil fuels today, but also a massively inefficient use of resources. Cities should minimize hot pavement with mixed-use, multifamily, transit-oriented development. Of course, while this lets cities get by without private cars altogether, they should have electric service vehicles, but they need to regulate them to less than 20 kilometers per hour or 12 miles an hour for safety's sake. In a previous episode, I've shown how all service vehicles, including emergency vehicles, can provide the same response times and level of service that we enjoy in cities today in the much higher density footprint of the Eden city plan. And finally, cities should shade dwellings with narrow, tall courtyards and vines on rooftop trellises. All right, what about the broader regions in the departure areas? Well, the big theme is to shift from monoculture to polyculture, that is, from giant farms that grow all just one crop at a time to systems that I've discussed in prior episodes where you have a mosaic of smaller crops that benefit each other. Regions should also reforest and afforest where possible, especially on steep hills, as they've done in the Los Plateau in China, to great effect. They basically greened an area the size of Belgium in 10 years that started its descent into near desert a thousand years ago, and I'll post a link to that in the description. Planting should work along contour to recharge groundwater and buffer floods and droughts, and regions should support those indigenous livelihoods that build biodiversity. Now, so far we're talking about good sense land management just about anywhere, but in these departure zones, it will be especially important to control grazing animals by penning them and feeding them as they did in the Lewis Plateau, or by fencing and rotating tightly packed herds as Alan Savory has demonstrated in various parts of the world. Now in this slide, I've taken an image from Andrew Millison's amazing video about the Great Green Wall of Africa how Senegal and a number of other countries are building these structures that you see here to bring back a tree canopy that will stop the Sahara Desert from crossing the Senegal River and encroaching on the Sahel and the savannas beyond it. As explained in Millicent's video, these structures are actually an indigenous invention that has been rediscovered and rolled out at scale to bring back a hardy polycultural forest. And the idea is, well, he'll explain it in his video. Go have a look. The bottom line is that the departure areas don't need to be departure areas if cities and regions really get on board with ecologically sound land management practices. What about the arrival areas? Well, it's going to be many of the same techniques, but for slightly different reasons. Cities in arrival areas need to control costs and sprawl with high-speed rail, again, and mixed-use, multifamily, transit-oriented development. They need to recharge groundwater with natural drainage basins. And because they're designing away from cars, they need the local electric service vehicles to be governed to 20 kilometers an hour, 12 miles an hour. Of course, the arrival regions will need renewable energy. In the case of Russia, a special case, they don't have a whole lot of hydro storage capacity available, so they might need to rely on things like deep geothermal. Also important in arrival cities will be affordable housing in every neighborhood. I did a whole episode on that. I'll drop a link at the end of this episode. And paying extra attention to urban agriculture and urban forestry. Why? Well, many of the migrants will be coming from rural areas, and paying really strong attention to urban agriculture uses their actual experience and job skills. Now, it's true that with the shift from monoculture to polyculture, people who are coming from large industrial farms will still be learning and applying a lot of new techniques. But from what I've seen as a former market gardener, polycultures are a lot more fun and healthy 
to work in. Meanwhile, regions should focus on reforestation, afforestation, especially on steep hills as before, and work along contour to recharge groundwater and buffer floods and droughts. Again, I'll talk a lot more about water in one or more future episodes, but these are just very basic permaculture techniques that work just fine at scale. Now, none of this is to minimize the severity of the situation we're in. We are facing a bigger climate dislocation than we've faced in 6,000 years. It's going to happen in most viewers' lifetime. But with attention to sound urbanism and sound ecological design, we can not only get through it, but create much better places to live than most people in most cities in the world enjoy today. Okay, here's that link I promised about no bad neighborhoods. And next week, I'm going to be focusing on climate migrations within the United States, talking about many more details, such as dust storms, fires, loss of crop viability, and so forth. So if you're involved in city planning, real estate, or just want to get a sense of where to live and what to push for wherever you live, you don't want to miss that. Take care, stay green, see you next time.